conducted a bunch of examples and thought experiments about the equivalence principle so we can get a good feeling for what it means. First, let's look at the basic idea that Einstein used to develop the concept of gravity. His great insight was, a falling man does not feel his own weight. As you can see from this diagram, you've got a man, and he's in a box, which happens to be a room or laboratory, and he's floating in space. He's freely falling inside this box with everything else, all falling at the same rate towards the Earth, or if he's deep in space, far, far, far away from everything. These two situations, according to Einstein's equivalence principle, are exactly identical. We will call them free-falling or inertial frames, and we're going to justify that later with many examples. Next, to see the effect of Einstein equivalence principle, let's take this guy and put him in a deep space. He's got his laboratory, and inside this laboratory, floating far from anywhere, he's pointing a laser across the lab at the far wall. In addition, there's some magnets at rest. These will, of course, make no electric currents in nearby conductors unless he starts moving the magnet around. Further, observations of atoms and molecules from chemistry experiments or spectroscopic measurements will not experience Doppler broadening or any redshift or blue shift. Nuclear processes behave as they do in any laboratory at rest. They'll just behave normally. Well, as normal as it is to be floating out in space far away from any gravity. And finally, let's say we have two balls of the same mass, but different compositions. They're just going to float there, maintaining their relative positions. This would also be true if they're made of the same stuff, but of differing masses. As the experimenter does more and more thorough experiments, he or she would discover that the laws of special relativity hold in the laboratory for all experiments, because at this point, they're far, far away from any gravitational fields. So any small-scale laboratory test that involves speeds close to that of light will show time dilation, length contraction, and clock desynchronization. This is exactly what is known from special relativity, which I talked about previously. But now, sometime later, the lab drifts closer to some star and gets caught in its orbit. The lab begins to fall freely around the star, changing speed as per Kepler's laws, speeding up when it gets closer and slowing down when it gets farther. Since the lab is small with respect to the gravitational field, or if the gravitational field is not extremely strong and there are no windows, the experimenter will not be able to tell that they're in orbit. They're freely falling around the star. It'll be just the same as if they're floating out deep in space as before. There'll be no experiment that will be able to show that they're in orbit around a star. And of course, I'm ignoring the non-uniformity of this gravitational field. There will, of course, be tidal forces due to that. But removing that, we can make the orbit large, like the size of Jupiter's orbit at about five astronomical units. That should do it, unless, of course, the lab then falls towards Jupiter or whatever. In general, though, in a locally uniform gravitational field, our intrepid experimenter or trapped experimenter doomed to work alone in a windowless box will still think they're out blissfully deep in outer space. Let's look at one experiment on board, a laser. In both instances, we see the labs are freely falling. In both cases, we say they are in inertial reference frames and the laser goes across the room in what the experimenter measures to be a straight line. On the right, deep in space, far away from any gravitational source, he shoots the laser across and it hits the far wall straight. The same will happen if you're freely falling in the Earth's gravitational field. This works for any orientation due to the local positional invariance. Of course, there will be a change due to the inevitable quick and abrupt stop for the person on the left. Other than that, there's no way to tell whether you're falling in a uniform gravitational field or truly, freely falling Lorentz frame. Things are different when you start on the ground. This is the classic example of the Einstein equivalence principle. The person inside this closed room will feel their weight as they stand up. Apples will fall with 1g acceleration towards the ground. The person will also feel a weight of 1g if the lab is in a rocket accelerating upwards at 1g acceleration. This assumes that our rocket starts accelerating in deep space, far away from any planets or stars, and that our experimenters slept through the engine ignition or whatever magic transformed the entire Earth into a rocket in a blink. Given continuing silencers on the rocket, there would be no difference in the effect of the acceleration of a rocket versus the weight of standing on the ground on the Earth. This has interesting consequences. Let's say now you're deep in space, and we'll imagine two observers looking at the same event. One observer is weightless, floating only on a space station, and only standing there because of magnetic boots or something. The other is more safely in a rocket. 
accelerating upwards past the station. Inside the rocket, there are three apples suspended in a row. The space station observer, let's call him Stuart. Stuart sees them in a straight line, which just so happens to line up with some batons. And he has this magical thing with the batons where he lets them go and to do whatever they're going to do. But initially, they're lined up with the batons. The rocket observer, let's call him Elton because he's a rocket man, sees them start off in a row as well at the top of the box of the rocket. As the rocket accelerates upwards, the batons release their magical hold and the apples are allowed to move freely. Note that this is in deep space and the rocket and space station do not have enough mass to be significant gravitational bodies. Let's now say that the two leftmost apples stay put. But let's say that the rightmost apple is given a tiny shove when the batons let go. Now, all three apples are free to move and don't have an initial velocity. And one is moving to the right at, say, a foot per second at constant speed. Let's see what happens. First, we note that Elton feels his weight as the rocket accelerate and Stuart stays floating. Well, he would float off if his mag boots turned off, but he is floating along with his little space station. The apples, according to Elton, appear to be falling towards the floor. But according to Stuart, they're staying in a line with the magic batons. Both see the rightmost apple drift further rightward. The rocket accelerates and picks up speed. Stuart still sees a straight line, but Elton sees them falling faster. Lastly, they hit the floor because the rocket has accelerated up to meet them. Stuart last saw them just before they splattered on impact as still in a straight line, which is what he saw the entire time. But now let's look at a summary of all these steps. As you can see, according to Elton, inside the rocket, the apples fell and the rightmost one traced a parabolic curve downward. This is just like on Earth if you throw something off a ledge. Now let's assume the rocket was accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared and that the rocket's windows are closed. As per the weak equivalence principle, Elton couldn't tell if he was on Earth or in a rocket. And that's the essence of this. This comparison shows that there is a complete equivalence of the two non-inertial, non-free-falling accelerated reference frames. On the left side, it's a rocket accelerated frame, and on the right side, it's a gravitational field. And there's no way to tell the difference, and this is the weak equivalence principle in action. There's no difference at all between inertial mass and gravitational mass. Let's now see the effect on something that...